Well, tomorrow's Father's Day, so you might appreciate this joke. I mean, Labor Day, thank you. I was just testing you to see if you're paying attention to me. Since it's Labor Day tomorrow, you might appreciate The father said to his son, did you know that most people on this, uh, on this day, they don't even have to work on Labor Day? The son said, well, if they don't have to work, shouldn't we be calling it non-Labor Day? Oh, I didn't think you were going to like that one, so I got a second joke as a backup. <laughs> a daughter asked her mother, is Auntie Diane having her baby tomorrow? The mother replied, no. Why would you think she's having it, giving birth tomorrow? Daughter said, because tomorrow is Labor Day. <laughs> All right, it's better. Okay. <laughs> All right, how many of y'all brought your Bibles? <laughs> Lift them up real high and say this. Say, this is my Bible. It is the Word of God. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. And I have what it says I have. I boldly declare that my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and my cell phone is off. I will never be the same in Jesus' name. You hear that, devil? I will never, ever, ever be the same again. Turn to someone right next to you, look him straight in the eye and say, did you hear that, child of God? I will never, never, ever be the same again. Well, God bless you. Open up your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7 as we continue our series on the Sermon on the Mount. And I should let you know we are beginning children's ministry on Sundays, 11 o'clock, a week from next Sunday. Not next Sunday, but the week afterwards. So bring your kids. So kids, you're going to get to go with your, your, your peers at the 11 o'clock service. Only the 11, not the 9 o'clock just yet, okay? And then, of course, we have children's ministry at that time for Wednesday Bible study. Okay, I needed to get that announcement out. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, Jesus speaking. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, oh, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Can I ask this question? Is this a hard teaching to practice? If you say, no, I don't judge people, uh, you're probably the biggest judger. No, because you should feel the impact of this. Do not judge or you. Do not judge and you won't be judged. For the way you judge others, ready? God will judge you in that same manner. We have to be very careful about judging. People have asked, well, what about the passage where it says, judge righteously? Absolutely. And that's what he's talking about. He's dealing with unrighteous judgment, trying to take the speck out of your brother's eye and not even concern about your own sins that are bigger than your brother's. That's not judging righteously. Now, let me say what this passage does not say. The passage does not say that sin doesn't exist, that morality doesn't exist. Whatever people want to do, it's okay with God and it should be okay with you. Let it be. Let, the, let people alone, just whatever they want to do, how they want to live, don't even talk about it. And I've heard people kind of give this impression that it's not our place to judge, therefore their way of saying it is, don't judge what I'm doing. And yet these very people will judge what others are doing. But don't judge me, but I can judge them. I hear this a lot because uh, those in the, uh, in the LGBT community, they love this passage. Do not judge. And they'll say, Bishop Brown, what business is it of you to judge us? First of all, I'm not judging you. I refuse to judge anyone. Jesus said, I do not judge anyone. My word will judge them. So even our Lord, who is the final judge, 
says, I'm not going to judge them. My word's going to do the judging. So here's, here's the deal. I'm not going to offer you my opinion. Oprah Winfrey told, asked T.D. Jakes one day, what do you think, what's your opinion on same-sex marriage and homosexuality? What's your opinion? And you know what he said? Oprah, I don't have an opinion. Because I'm not here to offer my opinion to people. I'm here only to tell people what God says. What wisdom. You see, what does God say? So when people say, well, don't judge this, because, you know, after all, Pope Francis, Bishop Brown, when a reporter asked him, what do you think of homosexuality? And Pope Francis says, who am I to judge? Of course we're not the judge. But yet I've heard people twist Pope Francis' words to say that now the Catholic Church affirms homosexuality because Pope Francis says, who am I to judge? Check the catechism. It's still against homosexuality. He wasn't saying that. What he's making the point is, we're all sinful. He has sins that need to be forgiven. And his opinion doesn't matter. Even if he's the Pope, the Pope cannot determine morality. The Pope and every minister's job is not to say what is moral, but only to define and clarify what is moral that God himself has already declared. See, our job is not... See, so I leave it alone. So if you want me to say, well, I want you to say homosexuality is okay. Well, I'm not because of the word of God. But what I'm not going to do is judge you because I'm not your judge. You're going to stand before God and his word will do the judging. You see? So I, I bring this up because people will twist this phrase, do not judge, to mean you can't say anything wrong about me. Whatever I do, if I molest a child, if I rob a bank, don't judge me. And now, now you see how silly that sounds? I'm making the point. In fact, the whole Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is dealing with morality. Don't commit adultery. Don't even lust at another woman. Don't murder, but don't even be angry with your brother. And even when you give to the needy, don't announce it with the trumpets. Give in secret. Jesus says, I want you to pray. But pray in secret. I want you to fast, but don't let others know what you're doing. Keep it a secret. Just between, He's teaching morality throughout the entire Sermon on the Mount. He can, in one instant, all of a sudden nullify morality. He's not nullifying it, but what he's doing, he's warning all of us. Let's not think we're God to be their judge. But God's word still judges, and if God doesn't tell us what's right and wrong then how could we ever be accountable to God? He has to let us know in this life what's right and wrong, for how shall we repent if we don't know from God what's right and wrong? But we have to be careful of judging. There's different... There are a few ways that people judge that is so wrong. I think the first thing that we have to avoid is we, quit, we, we have to stop judging over disputable matters. Uh, Sonia and I, we got our flu shot this, um, I think Monday was it? I think Monday or Tuesday, we got our flu shot. And like always, every time I get my flu shot every year, I go on social media telling people I got it, please go get it, and especially with COVID. And uh, God forbid if COVID rises up in the winter, you got people with flu going to the hospital and COVID together, that's a disaster in the making. So I'm encouraging people to get it. But I also know not everyone agrees with vaccines. Now, I personally think you're wrong, but I'm not going to tell you because there's nowhere in the Bible that says, thou shalt not commit adultery and thou shalt get vaccines. It's silent. That doesn't say anything about it. But yet every year, every year I get the vaccine shot and I go on every year. I get condemned and criticized by my Facebook friends. Do you realize what's in it? This one lady wrote to me and said, tell me, I'm curious when you, because it makes you sick. So tell me when you get, I can't wait to find out how quick you get sick. I'm thinking, I've been taking the vaccine for 20 years and I have yet to get sick right after the vaccine. 
But again, there's the Christian playing God, telling you what you should and shouldn't do. We have to stop making judgments over disputable matters. One person thinks it's okay, another person does not. You let people decide for themselves on matters that are not explicitly mentioned in scriptures. People have to use their common sense, what they think is right, their experiences in life that help formulate their decisions, and then they decide. Yet, what business is it of me to condemn you for not getting one any more than it is your business to condemn me for getting one? Let it alone. Paul dealt with this in Romans chapter 14, in verse 4. He said, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Verse 10, you then, why do you judge your brother? Why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before whose seat? God's judgment seat. Now here's a revelation. There is a God. The second revelation, you're not him. You're not him. Pinch yourself. You're not God. So who are you to judge another servant? Now what Paul is doing, he's dealing with a disputable matter in the church. He was dealing with a split faction between Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. For the Gentile Christians, drinking wine was associated with the Roman government. The senators, the Caesars were known to be drunks, committing debauchery. So they associated drinking with that pagan religion. So the Jews, they drank all the time. There was not a problem. Jesus drank. Does that shock you? He turned water into what? Wine. So you know what Paul says? Someone who drinks wine, he tells the Gentiles, quit condemning your Jewish brothers who drink wine, they find nothing wrong with it. Just because you think it's associated with paganism doesn't mean they think it's associated. Then he reverses it. Because Gentiles ate anything. They ate all sorts of foods. While Jews considered pork unclean. And he tells the Jewish believers, and for your Gentile brothers that eat pork chops, he doesn't say pork chops, but you get the idea, who eat anything. Why do you judge them for what they eat? So do you see this? He's telling Gentiles, don't judge the Jews for the alcohol, and you Jews don't judge the Gentiles for the pork chops. Because the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So listen, stop judging about disputable matters. It's not even worth it. Why go there? But the second mistake people make in judging is they judge over minor faults. Um, think of what Jesus said. Why do you look to try to take the splinter or the speck of sawdust, something that's irritating someone's eye? You're trying to help them with a little dust in their eyes. Now, why does he do this? He's saying, do you see how you're judging over such small matters. There's bigger fish to fry. There's more important things than that. Why are you focusing on these minor offenses of life? So your wife squeezes the toothpaste in the middle. So your husband watches a little bit too much TV. So your kids don't clean up all the time. It's minor yet you make a big deal over things splinters in the eyes when there's a plank in your own eye uh, when we came, um, we had a family vacation in Montana and Sonia and I and Faith and Daniel my son-in-law we came back on the same flight from Montana to Denver and then from Denver we went to El Paso and my daughter and son-in-law went to Tulsa so we were at the same airport, and we're ready to say goodbye to them as they go to their Tulsa flight. And as they're headed to the Tulsa flight, all of a sudden, I got this something that came into my eye. 
Now, there was smoke uh, coming from the fires of California, and when we're landing, you see all this smoke. Who knows, maybe it was the smoke, the irritant, but something got in my eye, and I started to teary eye. I could hardly look. You've, who's ever, I want to ask this. Who has ever experienced something in their eye? Let me see your hands. Is that everyone? That's the point. You're trying to help someone when all of us have human faults. Why is it such a big deal to correct these minor things? Well, you know, I said bye to my daughter and son-in-law, and I'm t crying, but not, and I told them, I'm not crying because I'm not seeing you. Actually, I'm crying because I can't see you, but <laughs> I got this. And so I'm hugging them and, and, and kissing them goodbye, and they're, they're taking off. Now, listen to me. My daughter, Faith, my son-in-law, Daniel, and my wife, Sonia, not one of them helped me try to get the thing out of my eye. No one helped me. You know why they didn't help me? Because they have smarts. They already know daddy's going to get it out. He doesn't need our help because we've all had it and it comes out by itself. We don't need anyone's aid. It's going to get cleared up by itself. Are you ready? Leave some people alone. Leave your husband alone, wife. Husband, leave your wife. Quit focusing on these little things that become irritants. And it's such a big deal to you. It's a big deal. It's not. You have to know what's a big deal and what's not. And when you're focusing on these minor things, you're making matters worse. One of my favorite passages is Psalm 19, verse 12 and 13. David says, who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and innocent of what? Great transgressions. Watch this. He says, I don't want to commit great transgressions. Because great transgressions have great pain and problems with it. But you know what he says? But these little small faults of mine, just forgive them. I'm probably not going to change I want to change. I would like to have none of these faults, but I'm probably going to have the faults. But you know what we do? We try to fix everyone's faults. Leave it alone. It's not worth it. These little splinters in people's eyes, and it seems so big to you. But Bishop, I don't know if what I'm dealing with is something big or something small. If you don't know, then shut up. Okay? Thank you for those four hand claps. I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, getting them more. Then shut up. Don't, don't even bother. I don't know if I should be dealing with this or not. Then don't deal with it. Can't you figure that? I don't know if I should talk to this brother. Don't talk if you don't know. Shut up. You people just jump into everything. Just leave things alone. But a third mistake people make. You say, well, how many are you going to give us? 25. So hang in there. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> the third one is judging through gossip. Mm -hmm. How do we judge through gossip? See, you never confronted the person. You don't know for sure whether they did this or not. Or if they, you're pretty sure they did it, but you never give them a chance to repent from it. Don't even give them a chance. And then boom, your mouth goes. You know what we do through gossip? We hurt people's reputation. We could damage relationships, ruin marriages, destroy businesses, take away people's careers because of the big mouth. Listen to what Jesus said on how we are to deal with someone who hurts us. And what they did is significant enough to bring it up to them. Watch what Jesus said in Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault 
just between the two of you, but have it recorded so you can go ahead and broadcast it on Facebook, on Instagram. Make sure you save the email so you can send it to everybody. Keep the text so you can let everybody know what they did. No, no, no. What does it say? Go and point out their fault. What? Just between who? The two of you. Just you two. Nobody else. Just you two. Someone has hurt you enough where you must talk to them. Who do you? You don't talk to your spouse, to your mama. You don't talk to your kids. You don't talk to your boss. You don't talk to the bishop. You know how many times I have people write to me? Bishop, does so-and-so go to your church? I said, yes. Well, I got a bone to pick with them. I said, well, then go pick it with them. Oh, they're, you're their pastor. So what? Jesus said, and I, tell, and I quote this. I quote this pastor a lot. If they've sinned, talk to them by themselves. And the fact, and, can, and here's what I tell them too. The fact that you already are gossiping about them and they cannot even defend themselves, you have defaulted in this right to even confront them. You blew it. So shut up and leave it alone. You shouldn't have been talking to people. But that's what judgment is. We have subtle ways to judge people. If we can hurt their reputation, make people not like them, we'll do that instead of confronting them. But what does Jesus say? Go show your fault between your brother, just you two. And if he listens to you, you've won your brother. It ends. No, no one knows a single thing about what you did or what they did. And the moment you start broadcasting it, it shows you're judging them. You have a way to keep hurting them. Yeah, but they didn't really mean it when they said, I'm sorry. Oh, so now you're God and you know their heart. You know what they mean. You know everything about them. You have to stop it. That's a form of judging. But the fourth thing that we often do is we judge repentant sins. We judge people for the sins they have repented from. How many of you believe that if you repent from a sin, God forgives you? Who believes that if you repent, God forgives you? Well, then, if they repent then why are you judging them for what God has forgiven them? You can't have it both ways. Forgiveness is an antithesis to judging. Here's what Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, verse 3. If your brother sins, rebuke him. How many of y'all like that part? Rebuke him. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if they repent, how many of y'all like this next one? Forgive them. You can't forgive them and then punish them through gossip, maligning them, putting them down. If they repented, why are you still talking about what they did? But the fifth mistake we make is we judge because of competition. This is especially true in politics. If you are a Democrat, then Trump to you is a racist and there is nothing he could ever say and do that could ever possibly be right. He's wrong all the time. And if you are a Republican, then Biden is one or two days going into the grave. There's nothing he could ever do that could ever be right in any sense. Where's our judgment coming from? Competition. We're on that side. So we, if we're a Republican, we close our eyes to anything that Trump does. We don't say anything. But we're very vocal if Biden says and does something wrong.